This is the Woke Daisy. Hey guys, welcome back to 12 Days of TWD. So today's mini episode of TWD makes my heart flutter a little bit. We're actually talking about books. And as an author, I've had the privilege of meeting quite a few South Asian authors who have largely grown up in the US and we're making it in the literature world, slowly but surely. And there's just so many unheard of writers or writers who have made it and just need to be talked about more. It's kind of like our podcast. Writers need reviews and writers need the word of mouth because that's the only way that creative fields really get to move. So not only am I making a shameless plug for the podcast, but also telling you that if you do like a particular book, that's the moment that you need to share it. Firsthand, I know this as being an author, but also because some of these writers deserve to be talked about so much. And the best way to get an an author to success is to talk about them. So we all share in each other's success. And, you know, while writing is a quieter journey than, say, acting or modeling or singing, it's equally creative and it's super, super fun to be a part of. We've all heard of Jhumpa Lahiri, who wrote The Interpreter of Maladies and The Namesake and a lot more. And many of us have heard of Vikram Seth's 1,349-page novel, A Suitable Boy, which is one of the longest English language novels ever published. Anaka told me that she read it in high school. Shocker. And speaking of high school, who can forget Thanuja Desai Haidier? She is actually the incredible author of one of my all-time favorite books, Born Confused. It was the first young adult book with a South Asian protagonist. And 12 years later, she came out with Bombay Blues, the sequel, which, to be honest, wasn't my favorite because I think I just grew up. But Born Confused remains one of my favorite books of all time for sentimental reasons and also because the story is just ahead of its time. It was accepting and it was diverse and it was beautiful and addressed so many issues that didn't quite have the names that were as PC as they are now, like cultural appropriation and all of these things that used to be really considered subversive and that people only talked about on like college campuses that are now all these mainstream topics like, like I said, cultural appropriation or having a trans character in a book. And those things are now talked about a lot more openly than they were. But when this came out in 2002, it rocked everybody's world. So one of my favorite South Asian authors of all time is Rupi Kaur. I know I talked about it on a previous episode, but she is a poet and a spoken word artist and New York Times bestseller. So all of her little poetry is centered around Insta poetry, which makes it accessible and vulnerable to the masses. So if you go on Instagram, you can see it popping up on almost every single Instagram page. And she illustrates with it as well. Yes. So a lot of the drawings that go along are ones that she, like, they're the ones that she has done. Yeah, her poetry can be very haunting and powerful and so uplifting all at the same time. She talks about social justice issues, feminism, cultural issues, and being uprooted, being feminine, and sometimes vulnerable feelings and love. And one of the biggest things with that was I actually read her poetry while I was going through heartbreak and she summarized being broken perfectly. She's an incredible, incredible author. For those of you who know, I post a lot of poetry on my Instagram and I will never be as good as her. And I will openly admit that because she is legitimately one of the most talented writers I have ever seen. Another talented writer who blew my mind was Chitra Banerjee Devakarni. So I actually hadn't heard about her books until probably six months ago or less. And I started reading two of her books first called The Palace of Illusions and The Forest of Enchantments. And what is so cool about her books is that she writes these strong female leads with heavy dose of Indian culture. And so The Palace of Illusions is one of my favorite books of all time because of the influence of religion. So all of you know, because I mentioned this all the time, My dad is a priest, and we grew up memorizing stories of the Ramayanam and the Mahabharata. And the Palace of Illusions is actually the entire story of Draupadi, the central character of the Mahabharata, the central female character. And it's about her life. And I was always really, really cautious whenever I approach stories like this because I just kept thinking, oh, well, they're going to botch the religious part. They're going to change the details of the story that are commonly known. And somehow it's going to be really like tweaked up and I'm just not going to want to listen to it and read it. I ended up loving this book, guys. It was so amazing. And it actually brought me a lot closer to religion, which is, sounds so funny because it's fiction, like kind of fiction or like a retelling of um, mythology. But I read it and 
went back to my parents and started arguing with them about the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And the Ramayana is actually what Forest of Enchantments is written about. It's the whole story from Sita's perspective. And they're all really feminist angles from this. The other thing is, is that she wrote stories like Mistress of Spices and some other books that aren't necessarily religiously based, but just have this really heavy element of Indianness to them. Another reason why you probably are obsessed with this author is because you grew up in a Brahmin household. You've always mentioned your background and how close you are with religion. So this is probably a great twist on it. It really was. I didn't think of these heroines in these stories as particularly feminist. You know, I mean, that's kind of what seems like a modern twist. But suddenly in this book, I was like completely amazed by it. And she writes so realistically, like wondering if Krishna is actually a god or wondering if he's just a man with a really amazing reputation that can do magical things. And imagining being in those eras and looking at your contemporaries, like I probably would wonder the same thing if I was Zeropadi, you know, because all of these things about like these people being gods or these people being avatars of gods, like all of these stories are things that have passed down over thousands of years. But imagine actually living at those times. And she does it so beautifully. Another writer that does a really, really amazing job of writing about culture is Arundhati Roy. And she wrote The God of Small Things. And it's about this like experience of fraternal twins whose lives are destroyed by the quote unquote love laws that lay down who should be loved and how and how much. And the book just explores how small things affect people's behaviors and their lives. So she won the Booker Prize and then she got in trouble in her home state of Kerala where the sexual nature of her writing made her face charges of obscenity. Oh my God, I need to read that one. (laughs) That sounds really cool. But um, there's another author that you've actually told me about called Salman Rushdie. And he wrote Midnight's Children. And he was previously married to Padma Lakshmi, the chef. So he actually wrote a book called The Satanic Verses and had a fatwa issued against him, which is a death sentence for insulting Islam. However, his writing is considered moving and combines magical realism with historical fiction. His work is concerned with the many connections, disruptions, and migrations between East and West civilizations. Now we're going to switch into some of the lesser known, but equally as legendary writers that we think you guys want to hear about, Annika included in this batch. (laughs) <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I do have a book coming out in 2021. So I am very excited. But no, on a personal note, the, uh, the author that we're actually going to open with is a friend of mine. This is not a plug, at least not one that she asked for. But Nisha Sharma is the author of My So-Called Bollywood Life. It's a young adult novel, and it follows a girl who wants to be a filmmaker, and she falls in love. She's destined for another boy, and she there's this prophecy, and it's just like this amazing story. And the, bo- the book was actually picked up for a movie deal by Gurinder Chadda, the director of Bend It Like Beckham and Bride and Prejudice. So she also wrote a crazy sexy book called The Takeover Effect, which is about boardroom politics and three very, very sexy Sikh Punjabi brothers. So if you want to support a badass, Nisha is it. Not only does she have more book deals and more adaptations to the screen and the works, she's actually a lawyer. And I've never seen a woman who can handle more than her. And if you look at her organization system, it puts mine to shame on multiple levels. <laughs> Another one I have to check out. Sonali Dave writes high drama, Bollywood-esque love stories filled with family drama, too. She is right up my alley with the insanely emotional high-stakes storytelling. A Bollywood bride, Bollywood affair, change of heart, distant heart, and pride, prejudice, and other flavors are all books she's written. A Bollywood Affair is super good, raw, and funny. Literally the cutest book because the main character is this grad student from India who was married as a child, though she's never met her husband, and she falls inadvertently for a guy named Samir, who is the brother of said husband, and was sent to get a divorce from the child marriage. It's crazy good, and it's insane. (laughs) Sonali writes such high emotionally. Like, it's just one of those things that you just want to sit down and read whenever you feel like your life is really boring. And her writing just transports you into a totally different world. And she's so talented. But if you want books who that are written by South Asians, but not necessarily about South Asian people, Sona Charai Potra is for you. So she wrote, along with her African-American co-author, Danielle Clayton, a series called Tiny Pretty Things and Shiny Broken Pieces, among others. And if you want a badass, Sona is it. She owns a company called Cake Literary, which is like a book management company. And the two books that I just mentioned 
Tiny Pretty Things and Shiny Broken Pieces actually just got picked up for a series with Netflix. They're coming to your screens in September because they just wrapped. So if you loved movies like Center Stage or Save the Last Dance, which were my favorites, then this series is perfect for you because it's about a ballet school in New York and the drama that it takes to become a principal dancer. And the main character is this black lead. And the story is so intense. And it's amazing because there's just such a realistic portrayal of what it takes to be this prima ballerina. Oh my God, it kind of sounds like a better version of Black Swan. And also, did you meet all of these people at that retreat you went on? The writing I retreat? did meet Sona as well. Yeah, I met Sona and Nisha. And Nisha I've known for a long time. Um, but yeah, I met Sona for the first time. And I kind of actually fangirled. I told her we were in the car. And I was like, um, I just have to say that I read both of your books in a sitting in six hours. And I was like fangirling. Like inside, my heart was like completely pounding. And I was just totally just such a mess. It was so funny. How did you feel being surrounded by so much amazing talent at that retreat and being locked in with them? Was it very healthy because you got your creative juices flowing or was it just empowering to see all these amazing authors take it so far? It was all the things. It was amazing because all of these people have not only so much talent, I mean, it is disgusting how much talent they have and how much was in that room at once. But we were all working together on our old projects and each of us have agents and book deals. And so we all got to compare stories about the publishing industry and talk about racism and talk about what the publishing landscape looks like in terms of books and why we don't necessarily see books of South Asian authors or why there's only a certain quota and we just happen to fall into it. It was really, really interesting in terms of learning learning more about the industry, but also eye-opening because so many of these people have, or at least two of them, have deals with major production companies and these books are getting adapted, which means our stories, our amazing South Asian stories are coming to the screens and that is a big, big. If you ever need someone to play someone in one of your books, Nehal Tanani is available for auditions. (gasps) I will add you to the <laughs> list of people who keep offering to do the audiobooks for yes. all of my books. <laughs> but I have a podcasting voice. What can I say? If you like young adult or magical realism, then you should check out Swati Thirudala. She wrote a book called Tiger at Midnight that came out this year, and it's an epic heart-pounding fantasy trilogy inspired by ancient Indian history and Hindu mythology. Perfect for fans of Saba Tahir and Rene Adia. We'll be telling you a little bit about Sabatha here right now because we really don't want to stick to just Indian authors. South Asian obviously does mean a lot of different countries and we're trying to be as inclusive as possible. And so one of the shining stars in publishing right now is a Pakistani American writer named Sabatha here. And she busted onto the literary scene in 2015. She has this incredible book called An Ember in the Ashes. And then it had two sequels after that called A Torch Against the Night and The Reaper at the Gates. And she sold the film rights to Paramount Pictures before the book was released. And now it's slated to be produced by the producers of The Chronicles of Narnia, The Notebook, Breaking Bad. I mean, the story takes place in this ancient fantasy world where a teenage girl is fighting to save her brother from prison and a soldier battles to free himself from the regime. And the book has just taken off. I mean, it is on it was on The New York Times. I think it made it all the way to number two. And she's incredibly, incredibly talented. So I would highly recommend that you guys all check her out if you are either interested in young adult or interested in fantasy. Farah Heron, another one of Annika's friends from the retreat that she went on, she is Canadian, Gujarati, Muslim, and the author of The Chai Factor, a romance and commentary on the lives of Muslims, prejudice in America, and activism. It's kind of awesome, and Farah's next book revolves around baking, which is kind of fun. Fun fact, I may have helped her title her next book, so I'm super pumped for that. And... Another thing that we wanted to really focus on actually was Muslim writers who are making a really big deal or making waves in the, the literary world. And my world was actually rocked um, last year or the year before, I believe, when I read this book called A Girl Like That. It's by Tenaz Badina. And you know how aunties gossip and it just drives us crazy? And sometimes even Indian kids and our contemporaries, our peers, used to gossip about us. And we'd inadvertently kind of make their gossip come true. Like, for example, if someone said, oh, you know, did you hear this girl did all this stuff with all these guys? And then they would see that girl happen to flirt with a guy that she really liked and it would just almost fulfill that prophecy. The book is 
kind of like that. It's about this girl who's a bit of a rebel and she was in Saudi Arabia and there's a ton of gossip that surround her that surrounds her and the story kind of flips between all these perspectives of the people that are around her and how she plays into it without realizing and the story is just about this tragedy that could have probably been prevented and it's just so amazing. I remember closing that book and just being like, what the actual fuck are we all doing to each other? So I would highly recommend that. If you guys have a couple hours to read it once again her name is Thanaz Batina and she wrote a book called A Girl Like That. Next we have Samira Ahmed. She's an American author of young adult fiction, poetry, and nonfiction, best known for her New York Times selling novel, Love, Hate, and Other Filters, and Internment. She wrote about interracial relationships in high school that charts cultural differences and just growing up and going to college and it was a great reminder of high school for me and what it was like. Her second book, Internment follows Indian American Muslim teen Layla Amin in her fight for freedom when she's forced into an internment camp along with her parents, which is actually a really sad reality that may come to life soon in this political climate. I know it's kind of sad how a lot of these stories that are coming forward are ones that are most likely either going to happen or that are like sometimes just feel like they're going to happen. You know, it's kind of a good way. They're like horror stories and meant to be fantasy, but then... Some of the shit is happening now and people have written these political stories that are like, you get the worst president ever or this is what's going to happen to your life and hello, we're living it. I know, but I think that that's why literature is so important and why people should pay attention to the voices of authors because they are writing what people are going through, you know, and they're writing the things that we're most afraid of and the things that we're most fearful of and as we're hurtling towards those, sometimes there's wisdom to be gained about not having those things happen and how to keep those things from happening because people are already prophesizing it, right? Like people are already starting to write these books about these horrible situations and maybe there's ways that we can actually keep them from happening. Finally, one of my favorite authors is one named Falguni Kotari. So she was actually on the retreat as well. So this was obviously a group of people that I was not paid or sponsored or asked to promote, but they've all had these paths to success that have just been outrageous. And so we had to share them and they were on these lists. And I was like, all right, well, kind of funny because I know them, but cool. And Falguni is the coolest mom. So she was the sole auntie on this trip. She has two kids who are a little bit older and She was so much fun. She grew up in Bombay and she is so funny. So I told her guys about the tickle monster because he had messaged while I was on this retreat and I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Because this guy is messaging me to be tickled and I'm taken and I don't want to answer this. And she just goes, give me the phone and I will call him and I will put him in his place And first off, she's a terrifying auntie. But secondly, she's also a powerhouse when it comes to her books. So she has this book called The Object of My Affection. And she also has a book called My Last Love Story, among many other books that she's written. And her stories are emotional and raw, and they kind of explore different things. Like The Object of My Affections is like about um, sort of – like the chosen family adoption. She and I actually talked at length about the podcast episode on adoption. And she's just so cool. And her books are absolutely amazing. So I would highly recommend that you check those out if you like edgy, romancy, kind of wild, crazy, fun stories. Because she is a character I can imagine coming out in her writing. And she's just an amazing human being. So obviously, guys, I have a lot of friends who are in the literary world, and so once again, I wasn't asked to talk about them, but they were on a number of lists about South Asian writers, and it just sounded so funny to me because I'm like, well, I just went away with these people, and it's really fun now to know that I'm amongst this circle, but there are so many of us in the circle that deserve attention, and this episode is just a small way of letting you know how many writers are there in so many genres who are writing our stories on a totally different platform, so So if you're listening to this podcast and if you're watching these movies and you're just trying to connect with somebody in the world, then these writers, these authors out there are writing these same stories that can make you feel less alone in the world. And it would be absolutely amazing if you check them out. So whether it's Sabah Tahir, Thanaz Badina, Samira Ahmed, Sonali Dev, Falguni, Nisha, I mean, whoever it is, there's a South Asian voice out there that is meant for you and whose books will speak to you in some way. So check them out and support them in any way you possibly can. 
Once again, guys, we are so happy to be here with you on the 12 Days of TWD. And these books will make great Christmas presents if you haven't done your Christmas shopping already. So before we end the episode, obviously, I can't do it without going to Nahal's favorite time. It's rapid fire round. So who is your favorite, or not even favorite, just a South Asian author, and you can pick one only that you want to give praise to? I'll say Tanuja Desai Haidir because she's the one that broke all the barriers. I would say Chetan Bhagat. I watched Three Idiots the movie and was super curious of where the story came from. And that was actually the first book I read because the book he wrote is called Five Point Someone, which is based on the Three Idiots movie. And so first South Asian The movie is based on the book. The movie is based on the book, I mean. But it was one of the first South Asian experiences that I've had with an author. And then what's a book you're looking forward to reading by a South Asian author? What is a book that you're looking forward to reading by a South Asian author? Nisha Sharma's second book, the sequel to My So-Called Bollywood Life, is called Radha's Recipe for Bollywood Beats. And it's a little bit darker and it's about dance. And I'm super, super excited for that to come out. As I've mentioned in previous podcasts, I'm a huge Reese Witherspoon fan, and I love reading the books on her book club list. And so I really want to read a book called Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows. Top of the list. That is also on my list as well. I've heard it's an amazing, amazing book. So guys, we didn't exactly cover that author, but her name is... Bali Kaur Jaswal. Yes. So please, please check her out as well. And... Like I said, support the authors that we talked about today. And hopefully that includes me in 2021. <laughs> and in the meantime, like we always say, get woke, stay woke, and stick with us for the other episodes of 12 Days of TWD. This is, this the, is woke the Woke Daisy. Woke.